I know this one is going to hit hard, uh, but it's very necessary. The consumption of wheat. Wheat as it is today is, uh, is not wheat that the Israelites used to eat. Somebody may say, well, I'm using wheat, but I'm still okay. I'm using the brown, Ilya Brown. Um, on that aspect... That's a whole different story. It, the the it's brown... It is wheat. It's still uh, wheat. Yani. <laughs> so, it is still wheat, okay. Actually, for people who are looking at the aspect of the glycemic index in wheat, brown bread <laughs> has higher glycemic index as compared to white bread. <laughs> the reason is because of, there's something called aminopectin. In wheat, you have this form of... Uh, uh, <laughs> the the, the people behind the camera on a skier who faint. <laughs> so, join us at Health Talk Desk. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share our videos to keep spreading vital thyroid health insights. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us again here at Health Talk Desk. We are glad to have you. Today, we are joined by uh, one plant based um, practitioner. Today, we're going to be talking about thyroid disease, but from a plant based perspective looking at thyroid disease from a holistic perspective and i tell you today we have um, a guest who is really going to convince you so that you're also able to have many options and that's what we are doing here at health top desk we're joining you from the africa resource center here at aea plaza eighth floor on valley road where um, they give you everything to do with studio there's a beautiful ambience good lighting so if you have any studio needs, please uh, be sure to contact them with the details that are linked um, on the description box below. And let me remind you, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Like and share the video and also save it for future reference. So um, Dr. Eric Ongaki, I don't know if I should call you Dr. Tari or, uh, yeah, but I know you're a doctor because you are very well versed in what you do. Um, tell us about yourself and uh, what is botanical therapy so plant-based medicine and uh, what inspired you to do to get started on doing what you're doing yeah um, my name is eric ongaki i'm a biobotanical therapist that is uh, doing therapy using plants i have a background in uh, medical laboratory science and also gained uh, quite a lot of interest in using plant medicine for uh, preventive and also as well as uh, curative measures or mm. curative purposes. Mm. I gained interest especially after studying pharmacognosy. Pharmacognosy is a unit where they offer or where people study about uh, plant medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, this was done in the early years of allopathy. Allopathy is medicine as we know it today, the conventional medicine. Before that, there was what is called homeopathy or naturopathy, okay. and how they studied in order to have these medicines that we have today in the pharmacies and uh, in, in hospitals is majorly, it was born from studying what indigenous populations were using from plants, okay. so they could go and study, uh, okay. realize the active components that they could easily isolate in the lab and also be able to make uh, to make artificial uh, mimicries or those ones which are going to come from uh, petroleum products. Actually, uh, the discovery of petroleum the being an hydrocarbon that is uh, able to change uh, uh, to desired levels or, or to desired uh, chains yes. and uh, carbons in, in it was, mm. uh, was a field that now opened a wide range of uh, pharmaceutical medications. Yeah. But before that, there were plants. Mm. On a daily basis, uh, human, beings, uh, human beings have to consume at least twice a, twice a day food. Mm -hmm. And this has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Even uh, uh, it's said that the father of medicine said, uh, uh, that Socrates said mm -hmm. that, uh, let food be the medicine, med medicine be thy food. And he also said that almost all diseases are caused by uh, the food that we consume. If sure. we consume the right food or the right way, yeah. we'll have uh, preventive measures for so many conditions if we don't uh, consume the right foods and in the right manner mm. therefore we are going to have uh, health conditions mm. where, uh, not entirely of all diseases are caused by food consumption mm -hmm. but 
many of them, including even the one that we are talking about today, mm -hmm. which is thyroid health, mm -hmm. food has a very huge weight in, 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 in yeah. uh, thyroid diseases. And uh, just to get onto that, because we've already started onto it, um, maybe we can uh, talk about how what the thyroid gland is and how the diet and lifestyle does affect thyroid disease. And maybe you can touch on also the different types of thyroid disorders as we go into, um, before we talk about what triggers them, because I think that is where a lot of weight probably is put on. Yeah, it's a very small organ mm -hmm. that, uh, located on the front region of your neck. It's uh, butterfly shaped or mm -hmm. shield uh, shaped in, in, in terms of anatomy. It's very small, but very, very key in the body. It has yes. uh, an effect on every single cell of the body. Uh, the only cells that have been said that they not they are not so much impacted by the thyroid mm -hmm. are cells found in nails. That's in the testicles. Mm -hmm. But for most cells of the body, the thyroid has a huge impact on it because mm -hmm. it's the major uh, organ mm -hmm. that produces hormones, which mm -hmm. are responsible for. Uh, metabolic our metabolism mm -hmm. the, the how the the body actually uh, builds and uses energy to do its various functions including growth mm -hmm. and also hormonal imbalances how people or hormonal balance how people uh, how the hormones in the body uh, are formed mm -hmm. how even you are growing how mm -hmm. the brain develops mm -hmm. and so many areas including even on temperature regulation in the body yeah yeah so it's a very key organ yeah when we look at the when there is an imbalance, and I'd like us uh, to see the thyroid as not the only or not the major cause of thyroid disease. Like mm -hmm. uh, usually, we s s uh, medicine today, most of it is focused on symptoms, That's what I call true. symptom focus. Mm -hmm. Now, that has led also to speci specialization. Mo many people have specialized in yeah. certain areas, which is good. Mm -hmm. But when you are looking at the thyroid, bearing in mind of the many uh, impact it has on the body, almost on every cell, right. we need to look at it from a point of not just, uh, not just the cause of these conditions, because it de it's dependent also on other factors for it to operate. Yeah. The major factor that it, it depends on, which is mostly environmental is what we are taking in and uh, to be more specific iodine mm -hmm. iodine plays a very major role a major role in uh, in this uh, in the functioning of the thyroid and also how the body also will mm -hmm. if the iodine has been assimilated well and the hormones have been made that's the t4 and t3 mm -hmm. it has a huge impact in, in the body now when there is an imbalance in how the body is utilizing iodine and also other uh, other uh, uh, nutrients like selenium mm -hmm. you'll you'll realize that the thyroid now depending on how it will respond mm -hmm. together with uh, the brain and uh, part of the brain that uh, uh, responds or is directly linked to the to the thyroid mm -hmm. there arises different kinds of conditions mm -hmm. that's where if the thyroid is meant to act uh, in a hyper way or in a more aggressive way mm -hmm. that brings about what is called hyperthyroidism. Okay. If it's about uh, being sluggish, that okay. brings about hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. Of course, these are uh, conditions. Sometimes they can come as primary mm -hmm. and sometimes they can come as secondary. Mm -hmm. You, uh, in uh, Thyroid Disease Awareness uh, Kenya Foundation, probably you have okay. had uh, members who their primary condition was hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. After treatment, it went to hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. Some of them have had hypothyroidism. After treatment, treatment the in surgery, yes. it goes to Hyper. hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. I mean hypo. Mm -hmm. So what matters here is uh, um, a state of homeostasis, how the body is going to balance all its functions. And therefore, the thyroid being part of the body will also act in similar principles. So I don't usually like to look at uh, the diseases as uh, individual compartments, mm -hmm. this thyroid disease, but rather fixing the thyroid. When you fix the thyroid, you are able to fix all these other, mm -hmm. other conditions. So how do we come about that we are, we are having an imbalance in how the thyroid is functioning? Mm -hmm. 
There are a number of uh, ways. One is uh, toxicity mm -hmm. in the thyroid. Uh, another one is nutritional deficiencies. Mm -hmm. More than ever before, mm -hmm. and the population is, uh, it's today that people are consuming foods which are not nutrient dense. Okay. Uh, because of the farming methods that have been used, mm -hmm. the uh, pesticides being used on uh, plants, mm -hmm. uh, uh, nutrition in the soil being mm -hmm. depleted in mm -hmm. a number of ways, and also a decrease in uh, people being aware of how uh, or on the foods that they consume. Most people are consuming uh, a diet which is so regular that you can, uh, using your fingertips, your two hands, you can identify the foods that they are eating. People are not eating variety. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, toxicity in the environment through the air and also through the water that they consume. True. Here is where we have actually the major, major triggers of this uh, thyroid conditions. A good example I'd like to point out on chlorides and bromides and also fluorides. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for that is when you go to the periodic table. Uh, back in school, if uh, we're trying to remember the chemistry well. Uh, it, iodine belongs to a group of elements called halogens. And the halogens on the, on the top of the list have a high affinity uh, as compared to iodine. That is, they have, a, if they are going to compete to attach to the thyroid mm -hmm. or to any other uh, area where they need to be attached as halogens, mm -hmm. they, and you put all them together, mm -hmm. those ones high up in mm -hmm. the periodic table mm -hmm. will be uh, more aggressive than those ones which are below in, an, in order for them to, to combine. Mm -hmm. Now, on a daily basis, we are uh, consuming things that have these uh, products in them, yet are very low in iodine. Okay. And even if we had the same levels of iodine with these other elements like chlor chlorine and fluoride, fluorides and also bromides, we, they are better competitors, competitors than iodine. Okay. Yeah, so that is a major cause that I'll, I, I would like that uh, any person who is either uh, a champion in thyroid disease mm -hmm. or is interested in thyroid health mm -hmm. should look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so we are talking about uh, thyroid disease and handling it from a natural perspective and managing, ma managing thyroid issues using um, a plant medicine. Now, you've talked about um, bromide and chloride. Yes. We find those in the water <laughs> that we drink, the toothpastes that we use, and so many other products. My question is, if people are not really able to avoid that, then what do we do? If it is like in the environment, Kamanile Maju and Akunyo, for example, and somebody is not able to afford to go buy bottled water, what can someone do? So uh, first, as they say, prevention is better than cure. So as much as possible, we should look towards uh, preventing, and that means trying to avoid these chemicals. But also, you realize that many people today have been exposed to these yeah, uh, yeah. chemicals. Mm -hmm. Be it uh, edaxin from uh, burning plastics or burning fuel. Mm -hmm. people are, more, more and more people are living in the cities. Mm -hmm. And this toxicity you cannot easily avoid. But the first step, as I said, is prevention. How are you going to prevent uh, the use of uh, uh, chloride basically minimize okay. uh, minimize the use or the intake of chlorine. Uh, how about fluorides? Especially for people who already have this uh, thyroid condition, okay. look towards uh, toothpaste that are fluoride, fluoride free. Uh -huh. They do not have fluoride in, in them. Uh -huh. uh, the other source where we find bromide, bromides okay. is a uh, in pesticides. Um, people living in the cities, most of them are getting food from uh, farmers, and these farmers, most of them are using pesticides. If you stop using these foods, it means you stop eating. So how are you going to lower uh, the consumption of these pesticides in, in your food? 
One very simple way is most of these bromide-based pesticides are about 97% acidic in nature, uh, which means if we applied during preparation, if we used an alkaline, uh, it will neutralize those acids and therefore it will not be very active as we consume them in mm -hmm. the body. Mm -hmm. And this will require only uh, the house help or you who is preparing food to use like two, three tablespoons of sodium bicarbonate okay. in the water in the sink. Okay. You rinse with it, the okay. you wait about five minutes mm -hmm. and then rinse the vegetables with it. Mm -hmm. That one reacts with the acid-based uh, uh, pesticides mm -hmm. and therefore renders them a bit free mm -hmm. to rinse them off the vegetables. Mm -hmm. Just rinsing with normal water, uh, it means that you are not going to have, uh, I mean those chemicals are a bit, they, they won't easily uh, go away. Yeah. That's about bromides. Mm -hmm. Now, there is also this component, uh, fluoride. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's found in toothpaste, mm -hmm. but also we are seeing it more and more in products which are on a daily uh, use. A good example is uh, many homes today have these carpets. Uh, when you look at how carpets are made, carp carpets are made uh, by compounds called perfluoridated compounds. As okay. they, as the years go, or as the time, as time goes, there is disintegration, and these components we are going to breathe them in the air on a daily basis. Yeah. It's better you do not have that carpet if you are a thyroid patient or if you are pre oh. you have predisposure to uh, thyroid conditions. I think uh, if someone is going to think about uh, what carpet then can I use, it's better we did uh, natural carpet. The, uh, the Makuti ones. The Makuti the ones, ones it's way better and it's a bit yeah. classic. Yeah. These yeah. are things you find in uh, uh, when people are going for vacations, they we, we, we tend to see them in such uh, environments, yes. but not necessarily using them at home. Yeah, but wait, so if what about if I can clean the carpet the way people have washing machines to just like try and uh, remove the dust, that doesn't help? We are I'm asking for those that have been buying carpets, like if you have a carpet in the house right now. In this, we are talking about the disintegration process. If I clean today, Remember, the carpet continues to live, it's mm -hmm. going to be stepped on. The disintegration mm -hmm. doesn't happen only when you are cleaning. Yeah. As it ages, the okay. disintegration continues. Okay. And through the stepping and uh, uh, continual okay. uh, use, it's now found in the environment and that's what we, we are breathing on a regular basis. Okay. Um, another area is dental floss. You may have used the dental floss. Yes. It has this uh, string, which yeah. is very uh, it strong. Has, yeah, it has some, yes. Yes, that string is coated with a fluoride-based uh, compound. And uh, uh, something else I would like to say here is, our skin absorb the, absorbs about 70% of what we put on it. Mm -hmm. the, the phthalates and parabens we put on or we put on the skin it absorbs about 70 percent that's why also it affects not just the thyroid or even the hormones of uh, especially ladies mm. and it's well to know that most people who have thyroid issues are majorly ladies now when we are using things like uh, the <coughs> toothpaste that is fully related and also <coughs> the length of flows uh, uh, when when you are using them it's good also to note that the skin goes also to the inside. Mm -hmm. The gut, starting from the mouth to the back, back opening, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, I mean the back opening, it's, it's a, an inverted skin. Mm -hmm. Now the, skin, the outside skin is able to absorb about 70% of, of what we put on it. Mm -hmm. The inside absorbs almost to 95 plus percent of what we put. On the skin? On, on the inside of it. That's from the mouth going down. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, and, and I've, I'm setting this so that someone may be asking, but while I'm brushing my teeth, mm -hmm. I may take only five or ten minutes and I'm off, or even two minutes. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Does that mean that I'll absorb much of it? Mm -hmm. We absorb at a higher rate because it's a, a thinner membrane as compared to the other skin. Okay. At a higher rate as compared to the, the skin. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, the absorption that is happening inside the gut, therefore, after absorption, where do we get these elements going into? Into the blood mm -hmm. di directly. So, and for the skin, does that mean also the makeup that for us women especially, what we use? Because I was reading somewhere they were saying women are more exposed to chemicals than men. Like if before I left in the house in the morning, I was probably exposed to more than 200 different types of chemicals. Does the skin, that means the makeup that women use, the things that we put in our hair, um, does that also affect? Most of the beauty products that people are using, especially in Africa, are not controlled. Uh, okay. We are not aware of how many chemicals are in them. And uh, remember I said earlier on, uh, the skin absorbs include, uh, including things like parabens and phthalates. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where you get a class of especially chlorides mm -hmm. in, in them. Mm -hmm. And if you are absorbing them, then they are also going into the body. They do not affect just the, how the thyroid functions, but also hormones. Mm -hmm. um, a simpler way that seems to be very effective is people to, if you are considering how I can use a, a natural product, mm -hmm. is just use things like raw shea butter to apply yeah. on the skin, the skin. And, and the likes. Now, there are those products which are already controlled, like for example, fluoride in toothpaste is actually a recommendation that is in the circles of science. Uh, where fluoride has been said to be helpful to the teeth. But that which is helpful to the teeth is available in the food that we are eating. We don't need to add it in the toothpaste okay. and the likes. And when you look at it very well, children who start using toothpaste earlier on uh, in life, mm. very early in life, mm. on a regular basis, they will have, it's, it's from such children that we are having uh, more tooth issues. But nonetheless, we, we may not, because of the dental industry, mm -hmm. I think it's better we have the perspective on that area. Mm -hmm. Another area is the effect that fluoride has to the brain. Uh, fluoride has been, there, there are studies which have shown that fluoridation to some levels affects uh, or leads to degeneration in neurons. Uh, I mean mental, mental degeneration, I mean brain, brain work. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are looking at what am I going to avoid or what am I going to minimize, especially for people already who are patients in this space, there is need to be a, bit, a little bit careful or a little bit juicy on what we need to put into our bodies. And for those who may be thinking like, ah, for me, I do not have uh, a thyroid issue, but they have these other issues like uh, um, maybe diabetes mm -hmm. and the likes. Mm -hmm. Remember earlier on we said that the thyroid is responsible heavily on every single cell of the body uh, for purposes of metabolism. Mm -hmm. And metabolic diseases, one of them is diabetes. It's not only insulin that takes a role, a role in it. There are also other issues, including even the thyroid health. Yeah. And uh, there is a tendency for people, actually, thyroid health, it, sh it should gain a little bit of attention in this country because yeah. when somebody has got a disease like diabetes, they are going to be given metformin and other, nini from other treatments. Mm -hmm. But the major perspective or the major uh, examination is usually uh, we're going to look at HbA1c that's glycidated uh, glucose mm -hmm. to see how your body has been using glucose in the last three months mm -hmm. and we also we will also look at insulin those are the two major areas of concern mm -hmm. but uh, diabetes is a metabolic disease and metabolism is affected highly by the thyroid. 
So we need to look beyond beyond just the thyroid. Be, uh, beyond just that condition, mm -hmm. but also try to look at what impact does the thyroid has in relation to such a it's such a condition. Okay. Yeah. Now on the other hand is these are the causes. So these are the things to avoid. What need I to use? Okay. Uh, the major once we have avoided toxins, once we have tried to minimize these toxicities, the major thing to look at is iodine. Um, how am I consuming iodine? And is it bioavailable to the body? Now, we have uh, salts which are iodized, which people use, uh, which is very okay. But a number of this iodine is not in a state that is bioavailable to do much good to, to, the, to the thyroid. And also there has been sometimes a shift from the use of iodized salt to salts like Himalayan salt yes. or sea salt, yes. which is tagged to be a good salt. It is a good salt, yes. I want to agree, but you realize that in most cases it does not have iodine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so imagine someone who is uh, using Himalayan salt for a long period of time without uh, supplementing iodine to the, to in, in their diet. Mm -hmm. It's going to be also a challenge. Okay. Yeah. But so what do you, please um, just try and clarify a little bit on the, that bio, bio, bioavailability. bioavailability aspect of the the fact that when we take iodine does that mean the iodine is not being absorbed or what does that mean when you when you look at some supplements which work very well in terms of providing iodine mm -hmm. it's not mostly in its free state uh, you'll find it uh, for example potassium iodide uh, a certain amount of potassium iodine, it has to be connected with something. Mm -hmm. Now talking about bioavailability, <clears throat> when iodine is absorbed into the body, it doesn't go like the iodine element. It has to be absorbed in an ionic form, ionic form that is in form of iodide. Okay. Uh, this form of, uh, I mean this form of iodide, when it's going to be absorbed in the body, it needs other carriers like potassium. Okay. And now, okay. when we're having the salt, what are we having? Sodium chloride. Yes. Which, with very trace amounts of potassium. Uh, sodium chloride, and then there is the iodine added, added to it. Healthy people, healthy individuals, the body is able to pick that, of course, under strain. But people who have a compromised thyroid, will, uh, 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 they need to do the one that is more bioavailable. That's where you now get uh, other supplements like, which are in form of potassium iodine or even something called iodor. Okay. Uh, and other, another form is using seafoods, the likes of kelp, uh, bladder, bladderac, simos. and simos. Uh, has various ways of consumption. There is the raw form, there is also the extract form. Mm -hmm. Depending on what the person is able to take in, they, it, it, uh, and also palatability. Okay, question. Now, when they start uh, implementing some of these foods like kelp and simos, because I have patients who, once they get started on that, it actually triggers hyperthyroidism if they were hypo. My question is, because um, we were talking with another doctor on a, a different segment and she said, Iodine, we, in our Kenya or in our geographical area, iodine is very available in our soils. So much so that you can find iodine in not just salt, in vegetables, in some types of fruits, I came to realize. So do you really think that the issue here is iodine? I mean, it is, but do you really think that that is what is causing a lot of... Uh, the thyroid issues that we have now, especially? We, I want to agree that there is uh, iodine available in a number of foods. Okay. But remember earlier on I said 
how iodine is going to compete with the other halogens okay. for the for the thyroid. Okay. Now, about patients taking in some of these foods, especially the one that the ones that are very rich in iodine, uh, you realize that someone is taking iodine. They haven't worked with the doctor in order to realize that mm -hmm. I need to adjust the medication that I'm doing mm -hmm. because you are going to consume iodine mm -hmm. and you will maintain the same number of mg's of B8 levothyroxine of what you are of what you are using or uh, even for those who have uh, hypothyroidism uh, uh, the the amount or the dosages needs to be uh, changed that's why it's necessary to work with uh, you are yeah. therapist yeah. Or, or, or or the doctor yeah. so there are areas where it needs guidance to, to look into it. Uh, there are also foods which necessary, they do not necessarily need a, 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 a guidance per se, like uh, uh, the consumption of these fruits. If we are consuming these fruits which are uh, rich in iodine, if we are consuming these plants which are also uh, good in iodine, if they have not high levels as compared to CMOS, mm -hmm. it doesn't cause any issue. Mm -hmm. But now there are foods which are very high mm -hmm. in such uh, such cases. For example, the CMOS yeah, that we have been talk yes. talking about, mm -hmm. which also needs to be given in terms of dosages. That's why some of these are also in supplement forms with mm -hmm. MGs uh, attached to them. I mean, the, num the milligrams that uh, one should okay. take. So you don't advise patients to just go and buy CMOS and... Yeah. You know, because I think that is what that is the narrative that is being sold out there a lot with people that are selling some of these products. And I've had patients who told me, I started taking this kelp and I am hyper. And when a patient is hypo and they tell me that they've started getting hyperthyroid symptoms, the first question I always ask is, What's what are you taking? Are you yes. Yeah. What are you taking? Are you on kelp? Are you on CMOS? Mostly those two, because I know they are very high in um, iodine. Okay, so let's talk about the, um, the specific plants, yeah, because now you're a plant um, medicine specialist. Specific plants that give certain nutrients that will be able to create a conducive environment for the thyroid gland to work um, effectively. What would you recommend? Because I know you're very well studied in plants. So let's uh, digress a little bit and come and talk about specific plants that a patient can use if they are willing to go the natural plant-based route. The principles of naturopathy in attempt to help a patient on any uh, condition, especially the chronic ones, uh, the focus usually you have to start with the gut. Okay. Why? Because this food, we are going to take it to the mouth and then into the stomach, into the intestines, then it will be ab absorbed in the body. Mm -hmm. So you, real you realize that uh, we need first to make this gut or alter this gut to the point where it's able to uh, assimilate this food. The body is able to assimilate this food. Mm -hmm. Toxicity comes also as a result of what we have been eating. If we are eating wrong things or if we are taking this chemicals through, majorly through water or foods, mm -hmm. we need also to start there. Mm -hmm. uh, once the colon has been uh, cleansed or the gut has been cleansed and also there is a need for repopulation, repopulation of what is called the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. uh, gut microbiome is an interesting area or an interesting subject, a subject especially when it comes to health in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, the number of bacteria that we have in the body is higher than the number of cells that we have in the body. Mm -hmm. And this bacteria has to be kept in a state where it's helping the body, not yeah. ruining the body. Okay. Now, uh, you have done a cleansing of the gut, you need to repopulate good bacteria, that's where uh, gut microbiome comes in, the use of probiotics and prebiotics. Prebiotics is food for the probiotics. Mm -hmm. Probiotics means probios, meaning pro-life. That is for life mm -hmm. and not against life. Yes. Now, these probiotics are going to be very helpful, especially in the absorption and assimilation of B vitamins, which happens 
uh, heavily on the colon. So with uh, this, uh, uh, an imbalance in these uh, microorganisms or microbiome, I can say, uh, an imbalance also leads to a minimal absorption of these vitamins that we are taking. Okay. You have had people probably who are using supplements that are meant to give them the B vitamins, but it's not benefiting them. Mm -hmm. It's taking a long time and not benefiting them and, and all that. Mm -hmm. Why is that happening? Because uh, the other area they need to look into or that they needs to be done well is what is going to enable these uh, B vitamins to be taken into the body well and also to be used in, in, in the body. After that, once you have ensured that the food I'm going to take in, the supplements I'm going to take in uh, are going to be absorbed uh, optimally or are going to be assimilated optimally mm -hmm. in the body, the next part we need to look at is now the thyroid. Okay. Uh, when we are addressing the causes, the solutions also lie in addressing the causes. When we are looking at why the thyroid is misbehaving, those are the causes. Okay. The approach also should be the same okay. from okay. cause to effect. Okay. So if this was the cause for this condition to come about, mm -hmm. I also need to look at what do I need to do concerning this particular cause. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, earlier on I said about how medicine today, uh, subconsciously of course, is majorly focused on uh, symptoms, um, a symptom management. Mm -hmm. This explains why somebody can be on a certain drug for 15 years without recovery. I mean, yes, uh, on management for that period of time. Yeah. But the body is a marvelous uh, machine. If it's given the right uh, conditions, if it's given the right things and shown the right path, it will recover. These bodies were not created to be dependent on medication. On, on medication. The body is able to heal itself. Mm -hmm. I like a book by uh, Barbara O'Neill. Mm -hmm. uh, the title is self Heal by Design. Mm -hmm. The body is designed in a way to heal itself. That's why when you have a cut, the body will have to repair it. Yes. So we expect that most of these organs also, when they are affected, mm -hmm. if we do it right, if we remove the toxicity that is in this body, mm -hmm. It means that we are going, the body is going to recover. Yes. And guess what? It's so true for the thyroid. They are, they are, they are, uh, we have worked with a number of... So I think that's very exciting. That's very exciting to know because I don't think that that is the narrative that is out there, especially from the conventional perspective. So many people are being, I think now that you put it, misadvised and misled and you're told, okay, you have to be on medication for the rest of your life, you know. So I think that is very important to catch. You can actually restore your thyroid gland naturally with plant medicine. I hope you got that. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that once you start looking after your thyroid naturally, it doesn't mean that you'll have to immediately withdraw from the medication. Medications. There is a way you work with, uh, now the dosage will be reduced from this uh, week or this month to mm. this to this level. Mm. Now, we were back on self heal by design. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have worked with patients who have been on uh, some of these medications for quite a long time, mm -hmm. and during the process of working with them, uh, they have been able to be let free of the medications that they have been using. Uh, the most recent case being a patient who has had the uh, hypothyroidism for about 15 years and that journey took about three months to hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism mm -hmm. to withdraw from, from that case. Mm -hmm. Now, that shows the power of how the body can heal and therefore start operating. And of course, that doesn't mean that after you are well, mm -hmm. now you go back to what causes the condition to begin with. Yeah, the lifestyle diet. <laughs> because there is something that led to the, uh, there was a cause, a cause for this yeah, yeah, condition. Yeah. So we need to eliminate whatever that caused that or even lower it mm -hmm. and put it in there, put them in the, in the right balance. Oh yeah, because what works can be upon us, I'm not taking medication like, ah, okay, I'm good. So you think like you can 
eat what you want, do what you want, and uh, and when you do that, it re-triggers it, right? Yeah. And uh, the, 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 it's not just about withdrawing the medication. If the issue was just that medication, mm -hmm. well, it will be left alone. But anybody who has had a thyroid issue knows that there are other conditions that come in. For example, mm -hmm. hypothyroidism patients will tend to gain weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, issues like brain fog, mm -hmm. which will lead to uh, inefficiency as a person. Yeah. Like, am I productive mm -hmm. or am I becoming less and less mm -hmm. productive in the field of work that, mm -hmm. that the yeah. patient is in? Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, the thyroid being a major organ that affects metabolism, mm -hmm. you realize that peop, uh, uh, probably you already have clients who, uh, they are thyroid patients, but they, after being thyroid patients, other conditions, conditions are setting in. Mm -hmm. Some of them, even younger, uh, as compared to the age that you would expect people to have a condition, condition like diabetes. Yes. So, it, the target here is not just about withdrawing the meds, but it's, a, it's rather looking at the body to be able to be set free from the possible conditions that are going to be attached with it in the long term, okay. or that are going to come along yeah. with this uh, condition yeah. in the long term. Okay. Yeah. So, um, now that you just mentioned about how you're withdrawing medication, it doesn't mean that you just go like cold turkey on it and stop taking medication. There's a way you... You, you're weaned off by the doctor. So you're talking about um, integrative, maybe, the integrative approach of, to health. So I want us to talk about the natural treatment versus the conventional. Maybe um, you can comment about, um, can they be used together? Or can, does a patient have the choice of wanting to approach and use just one path. If it's conventional, they do conventional. Because I know there are so many patients who ask, there's nothing I can do to treat this thyroid condition with just herbs and medicine. What do you have to say to them now that you are a specialist in pl plant medicine? Now, there has to be a way of determining what is the best route at this particular moment. The way, these ways include like having the lab, lab tests. Mm -hmm. You need to have your tests done. Mm -hmm. We need the hormonal pro profile. Mm -hmm. That's from the thyroid and also reproductive health because uh, reproductive health also has uh, a relational impact with, mm -hmm. the, uh, with thyroid health. After having these uh, reports, then you are able to know uh, what I'm going to address or what I should achieve it's this and this and this. That gives a lot of information concerning the regimen that you are going to use or the foods you are going to use, the herbs you are going to use and the supplements you are going to use in order to, in order to move from point A to point B. There are people in the first month they will drop the medication. There are people who may take a longer time to drop the medication medication okay. it does not require you to drop the medication Im immediately, immediately. Okay. but the question here probably is mm -hmm. can someone do integration mm -hmm. that's what it is you will have to do integration because a withdrawal of uh, drugs that target the endo endocrine system is not usually good uh, drugs that target the hormone uh, the hom hormones in the body when they are withdrawn immediately okay. without uh, a, a systematic way of uh, withdrawing them, mm -hmm. they have also risks attached to them. Okay. So it's good that uh, any person who is considering to go the natural way, mm -hmm. you, you need to be aware first, receive the education on what you expect the plants, the plants that are going to be used so that you also have the power to go through uh, research documents mm -hmm. which are available online to see if uh, my therapist talked about this plan that I'm going to use, what implications that it, does it have? Then have the conversation even before mm -hmm. beginning that treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, in the treatment, there needs to be also uh, 
the your endo, endocrinologist your doctor needs to also know that uh, there is something I'm doing you may not necessarily need to explain entirely what it is uh, because sometimes there is also a gap in information okay a gap in information this happens in this sense I'm exposed to this side of the coin mm -hmm. you are exposed to this side of the coin mm -hmm. if if I'm a doctor uh, or a herbalist, then I'm not exposed to the other side of the coin on how uh, levothyroxine works. Mm -hmm. Some may not be so open. Yeah, I to, wanted to mention that. Yes, yeah. some doctors may not be so open to the other party also uh, giving their input con yes. con concerning this mm -hmm. particular patient. But it's also good that as a client, you talk with your doctor. Tell, uh, tell them, I'm working with this uh, therapist who does this and this, mm -hmm. and there seems to be uh, success in probably in other patients. Uh, for example, from, from the TDAC Foundation, we, uh, the first session that we have had, probably we'll have another one, where we may have some people also who have gone through the journey, mm -hmm. because this knowledge also needs to be, to be shared. Yes. Uh, it takes information to know the risks that you are going to uh, expose yourself to and also the possible benefits that you're going to experience through the natural way uh, using the natural way yeah because i remember i spoke to we had another doctor here called dr sokwala and uh, she was talking about how now selenium is actually being considered from the conventional perspective of treating thyroid disorders but it has been a supplement that has been there for hundreds of years people have been using it it's just that of course there was this there's the study and the science and the clinical uh the clinical studies that have to go behind it so yeah i think um maybe before we go for a break uh i want to talk about personalization of treatment and this brings you in now as a botanical therapist or as a dietitian a botanical therapist and whatever else that you do because i know that there are very many out there but to be honest with you i don't think that there are very many people in your uh, caliber who are well versed the way you are in terms of studying plant medicine and really wanting to integrate it in medicine the way it, you are doing it and the way I know there are many others out there. We have functional medical practitioners now that are coming out. So when you hear about plant-based medicine, or have Korea, you know how those doctors give you some green stuff? You know? So sometimes you find that does not bring a lot of, of course, faith in people because there is no science research about it and i realized in kenya people are very scientific it's very hard to convince someone especially that knows more about conventional medicine that actually there is a way that plant-based medicine can work so um when you talk about personalization of treatment how important is it you know to tailor a plant-based therapy yeah for the treatment of thyroid disorders we do personalization because of the following reasons. Someone may have uh, hyperthyroidism but has not had uh, thyroidectomy. Mm -hmm. Someone may be having hypothyroidism but has no issues with weight. Mm -hmm. Someone may have uh, hypothyroidism together with issues like uh, gastritis and, and the rest. Mm -hmm. And also people have some food allergies. Mm -hmm. So it's very key that when looking into how the client is going to start the program, we do a history check or patient history check. Uh, you have this condition, yes. You have been on this medication. Uh, what else are you uh, having? What else is your body telling us? Uh, the body can be asymptomatic, so we'll, because of being in the field, there are areas we have identified that are likely to be happening. There is something's likely to be happening yet they have not shown symptoms. We'll send you for the tests. Mm -hmm. For example, we'll send for a uh, uh, full hemogram or blood work to look at 
what is your uh, erythroid segmentation rate being like? That's the ESR. Uh, what are the numbers of lymphocytes in your body? Uh, other uh, hormonal tests like uh, what are the values of uh, T4 as compared to T3 and TSH? Oh, and what will that tell me as, as Eric? Uh, uh, is it tending to more towards uh, autoimmunity and also bringing in other autoimmune conditions? Mm -hmm. That is the need uh, uh, for uh, personalization. Mm -hmm. A program that I'll give you may be a different program that I'll yes. give another, another client. Yes. Now, the importance of personalization here is first you are able to follow the client at an individual level mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Yes. To be able to help them uh, even uh, being in it, like I'm taking this treatment, but again, my personalized plan is a little bit different as someone else could be. Yeah. That one puts them on those where they need to be conscious of what yeah. they are doing, yeah. on uh, making uh, choices in a conscious manner. Yeah. If they are going to the market or if they are going to, if they, they are people, if he's, uh, he or she is a person who on a weekly basis or on every weekend will go to a party or somewhere. Mm -hmm. The choices they are going, they are going to make. Uh, for me, I may not choose this because uh, I understand the levels of a certain chemical in my yes. body are at this, yes. at, at this, at this level. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of uh, puzzleization it helps the client to know that they have control also to their health. That's a major component in health that needs to be advocated for, yeah. that I believe mm -hmm. so much. Yeah. So to the sense that uh, people should be educated as patients, there needs to be an aware in awareness of even the regimens that they are taking, of the possible side effects of the drugs that they are consuming, of how long they need to consume them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's often, and this I get quite a lot, mm -hmm. people ask, people usually raise their antennae towards plant medicine, mm -hmm. herbs, uh, mm -hmm. nutrition yeah. supplements, yeah. as compared to uh, pharmaceutical medi medicine. Yeah, that's, a, that's <laughs> For example, Camimazol, yes. PTU. Yeah. So, yet when they were going to take the Camimazol, a number of them it. did not raise that antennae of studying. It's yeah, to ask yourself, yes. what are the effects of the Camimazol long term? Yeah. What are the long-term effects of yes. this thing? What are the short-term effects? Mm -hmm. What am I willing to lose? Or what am I willing to, sometimes I may call it sacrifice? Or what are the possible uh, things that I may need to forego? Mm -hmm. For example, I've, I've had clients who they are on Kabimazol but want to have children. Actually, mm -hmm. some of them have lost even their uh, pregnancies yes, yes. before Very it's full time. Yeah, yeah. So awareness of what you are going to take is very, very necessary, both on the benefits and the, the side mm. effects. Mm. And it's always good. I do understand and believe that any learned person, any learned therapist, any learned doctor mm -hmm. will feel good that as a patient or as a client, you are asking questions in regard to the type of work they are going to do upon you. Yes. Uh, uh, do not be a kind of a person who is like, I'll get this instruction and I will do it. Just that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not the perfect way of taking care of your health because mm -hmm. that is your body. That's true. That's your body. Mm -hmm. It's not my body. Yeah. Yes, I may be a therapist, a, bi a biopotanical therapist, mm -hmm. but you need to be control of your body yeah. so that when you have this information, yeah. you are also able Sometimes it has a tendency of, uh, uh, let me not say genetical, but there are also genetical predispositions to some of these conditions. For example, uh, a mother who has hypothyroidism and has been on medication, mm -hmm. it has a tendency also to affect the child, the child yes. before they are born or even after they are born. Mm -hmm. That's why we, there are also uh, issues like hypothyroidism in children, in infants, or even in newborns. Uh, 
So it, it requires that one, uh, one needs to be very aware mm -hmm. because it's not just about you, mm -hmm. it's about family, it's about your children. Mm -hmm. It's also possible that you may gain that knowledge to help an, uh, a next of kin who may have that condition because you'll come to realize people who have had, there are people, there, there are clients who have met, they'll tell you, my sister had this condition. Yeah. Uh, after two years down the line, I also had this condition. Some of them have been exposed to the same level and amount of chemicals that led to issues like thyroiditis, which also leads to hyperthyroidism, mm -hmm. or even like Graves' disease. Mm -hmm. They were exposed to similar chemicals yeah. almost the similar time, and therefore you expect the that similar amount. Th there is a <laughs> likelihood that you'll have this right. condition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, Hey, there's a reason why I call him her Dr. Eric Berg Ongaki. Yeah, so please stay tuned. We'll be right back after this short break. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. We'll be right back. Join us at Health Talk Desk. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share our videos to keep spreading vital thyroid health insights. Welcome back to this very exciting session with Dr. Eric Ongaki. We hope you are learning something. Um, so we thank you that you've been uh, staying tuned to us. We're joining you from the Africa Resource Center here at the AE Plaza on 8th floor where they will cater for all your studio needs. Dr. Eric, so we were talking about a specific plants for thyroid, uh, uh, for thyroid disease. Uh, those the nutrients and the vitamins and what exactly it is that you you normally use or recommend while you are treating thyroid patients and the minerals as well. Now, the first concept uh, or the first principle mm -hmm. of approach when dealing with uh, any health condition is to understand that disease is an effort of nature to remedy the system of the imbalances or toxins which are brought along the disease or being not at ease with the body. Please repeat that again. Disease is the process disease of nature. Disease is an effort of nature yes. to remedy the body of the imbalances or of toxicities which have accumulated over time and have led to um, a distraction from the normal course of, of how the body would operate. Okay. So the, the body is showing a disease because it's trying to respond to remedy the either the, the deficiency or the toxicity that, that has come along. Okay. So we shouldn't look at the disease as an enemy as such. Um, and in an event that we have had this disease, we need to first examine the cause. After examining the cause, this body needs to be helped. After it has been helped for a while, to get to the place where it can continue healing itself by its whole own, then it's led on a course and trusting that this machinery is going to maintain itself going forward. Mm -hmm. So in that the approach, uh, in that approach, what we are looking at is, what is causing this? We identify the number of causes. Uh, there are those which come as a result of deficiencies. Deficiencies either as a result of not having enough iodine, but even for those who have enough iodine and probably things like selenium, uh, there has been competition by other chemicals. So deficiencies, then toxicities. We remedy it by removing the toxicities. And you have asked a question in particular that, uh, uh, that I'd like to respond to. In the plant world, what are the plants which are known for some of these thyroid conditions? When looking at removing toxicity, uh, I'd like to start first with uh, the use of activated charcoal. Activated charcoal, uh, other people call it activated carbon. Mm -hmm. Activated charcoal is carbon actually, and carbon has capabilities of adsorbing so many chemicals from the body whether internally or topically. Uh, oh. And you have seen a number of companies employing this method. Uh, of course, I wouldn't say that uh, it's very nini, but despite the mixing with other chemicals, mm -hmm. they have learned that there is a, a need for them uh, to incorporate charcoal-based products because of the effect charcoal has on, on, on health. Uh -huh. That's why you'll see some soaps, 
being added charcoal and all the likes. Mm -hmm. Why the charcoal? Charcoal, personally I recommend charcoal in, by itself without any other addition. Charcoal has capabilities of binding or absorbing toxins from the body, from any part of, of the, the body, depending on where it's going to be uh, placed. So there, this can be done directly on the thyroid as a poultice from the outside. Oh, okay. And also it can be done through ingestion. Uh, Somebody is thinking like uh, taking a little bit of kumeza maka. So <laughs> chako, actually some pharmacists have activated chako tablets. Some mm -hmm. health stores also have activated chako in either powder form or in tablets form. Mm -hmm. And the best of these chakos is uh, coconut shell chako. Coconut shell chako is an interesting one. It's able to absorb to even strontium 90, which is a radioactive element. You called it coconut? Coconut shell. The coconut shell? Yes. Any shell is coconut, it may chop more, it can Yeah. That has very excellent absorbing capabilities. Oh, wow. Another one is bamboo charcoal. Uh -huh. Now, there are other types of charcoal uh, uh, which are not as effective as coconut shell or bamboo, mm -hmm. but are also effective. Uh -huh. uh, the likes of uh, eucalyptus mm -hmm. uh, tree, a charcoal that has been uh, burned and also activated from the eucalyptus tree. That will take care of toxins. Other toxin removers are things like uh, bentonite clay, mm -hmm. which I know has also mm -hmm. been used yeah. in, in uh, the beauty industry, mm -hmm. but also in pharmaceutical industry. It's used, uh, it's added to uh, as experience mm -hmm. to some, some drugs. Uh, the best one is usually the uh, uh, the pharmaceutical grade one, which can be done also okay. internally. Uh, heavy metals also can be uh, removed by use of things like chlorella. This is a, a type of algae or algae, uh, and also uh, dania juice. I mean coriander juice. Juicy Dania. Eh? Yeah. Is that is it strong? Like uh, yeah, yeah. It's very strong. Really? Like two glasses a day for. Uh, actually, people can even test it. It works a lot. It does even heavy metal detoxification, things including like uh, lead and uh, mercury. Ah. For someone to test whether it's working, they can do a mercury test at the beginning. Uh, this is even for other conditions, including Alzheimer's and dementia. Oh, that's you, nice. You, Wait, so dania juice, you blend, I blend the juice. You juice the, the dania, you use a juice extractor. A juicer, okay. And then you juice. Now you, when I want a juicer, when I call a blender. Um, blending may bring about bloating, but come oh. to experience bloating, they can use it. Okay. If, if they not experience bloating as much, okay. they can use a blender and then you sieve the fluid and, and drink two glasses a day. If, um, if they were to test whether it's working, you before beginning you go and do a mercury test mm -hmm. maybe on the hair and also urine mm -hmm. then one week into it do another test two weeks into it do another test and then after four five days days do another uh, do another test these compounds that i've mentioned they are able to chelate those heavy metals mm -hmm. and the good thing actually with uh, things like uh, chlorella or coriander mm -hmm. it does not work like the there is something, there is a chelator that's also used in a hospital setting called EDTA. It has to be uh, administered by an expert, but that binds almost to every nutrient. The good thing with these other ones, they are able to bind with these chemicals and these heavy metals without necessarily depleting the body of the minerals that are beneficial okay. to it. Because uh, things like uh, coriander, uh, that's dania, in and of itself already has minerals that you are going to consume. Yes. Yeah. So from, from that aspect, once you have dealt with detoxification of that area, mm -hmm. remember I also said uh, uh, the gut is very key. So I mentioned about gut microbiome and also cleansing the gut. Mm -hmm. The other thing that is very key is the liver. The liver is responsible for the synthesis of cholesterol and cholesterol is used for the production of Hormones, uh, it's very, very key. 
Okay. Now, the liver has to be optimized. It's going to be optimized by a uh, use of, there are people who we can recommend, they do enemas, uh, especially coffee enemas, which is able to raise uh, glutathione levels to the level of seven times in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for others, we may not recommend that, uh, they can use other things like glutathione, itself, yes. uh, glutathione as a supplement. Mm -hmm. Another one is milk thistle. Mm -hmm. uh, these are plant very good for for the uh, liver. For, for the liver, mm -hmm. and even for those who have, uh, uh, if you have a patient or if you are a patient also who has undergone through either radiotherapy or chemotherapy, you can use especially chemotherapy. You can use milk thistle to potentiate the liver in the process of going through. The treatments. Uh, someone may ask, ah, milk thistle, these are herb. Yes, it's a herb. And most herbs are vegetables. They are parts of this country and uh, somewhere else, especially in Europe, where people take this as vegetables. I remember mm. a time, uh, there is a time we visited um, Luo Nyanza and our host actually prepared the milk thistle as a vegetable for us. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, we also look at the kidneys. It's very, very key because the kidney, for example, uh, the kidney has the adrenals uh, and also it's responsible for production of a hormone called erythroid or erythropoietin. Mm -hmm. uh, erythropoietin, this is an erythroid hormone, it's used, uh, it's transported to the bones to make blood in the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. And remember, people who have thyroid issues whether on medication or not, mm -hmm. in the long term they also have association with uh, bone health, mm -hmm. where there is a decline in bone health, mm -hmm. basically because uh, there is a hormone that is produced by the thyroid called, uh, actually parathyroid, called calcitonin. Calcitonin is responsible for regulation of calcium and phosphate ions in the, mm -hmm. in the body, which are also key elements in the formation of bones. Mm -hmm. The kidney is going to be optimized by the use of uh, what we can term as diuretics, but they are not diuretics also which will uh, cause demineralization. Mm -hmm. These diuretics are things like dandelion. In cost, they call it muchunga. Uh -huh. uh, I think in Kikuyu they call it otonga, ama otu, yes, something like that. In Kikamba, I think we call it mudunga or otunga or something. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. that name. Yeah. Uh, dandelion is a good one. And the people in the coast are a bit blessed. When it rains, uh, they eat a lot of muchunga, the dandelion, oh, as that? vegetables. Oh, really? <laughs> as food. That yeah. cleanses the kidney very much, yeah. and also it does other functions like yeah. uh, it's called. It's also referred to as a, a survival, a survival and nutritional plant. Where you, if you want to pack a lot of nutrition into the body, you can use that because oh. its structure as it grows, it puts uh, the roots go very deep. And therefore, the profile, uh, the length of how many nutrients it's going to absorb, it's quite a, a good range. So it's going to absorb, uh, to take in so many nutrients, in, uh, nutrients into mm -hmm. its system. So when you are doing it, you are going to mineralize the body with a lot of minerals. It is a very good diuretic. Uh, that also we give to people who have had issues like kidney, where they are, they are having edema, some of them may be on lasix and these other diuretics, but are not very helpful at a faster rate. So that is, is also helpful. Now, we have tackled the major organs. Mm -hmm. Now to... Why take all this time before we get the thyroid? Mm -hmm. It's because the thyroid is not an, an independent atom. It's not yeah. just an island. Yeah. It will have to work with other uh, organs, organs of the body. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we are going to the thyroid. Uh, the thyroid, they are basics. Uh, number one, nutrition. The nutrients that are required by the thyroid, even in the right amount, we need to give it iodine. We need to give it uh, selenium. But this selenium, for hyper patients, for hyper patients, it needs not to be given in huge amounts, very little. But for people who have hypothyroidism, it can be given in a slightly higher amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and this should be on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, together with uh, iodine, 
Um, actually, someone can do an iodine test for the, themselves. Uh, the traditional way or how homeopaths used to test is you get the iodine, you apply it on the skin, you look at, at what rate is it uh, being absorbed into the body. If, if after a length of time, like one hour, much of the iodine on the skin is, has not been absorbed, uh, that means uh, your iodine is sufficient. But most plants, you realize that once they apply that, it's, it's absorbed at a very high rate, which is a sign that they are iodine deficient. So there are cases where even hyperthyroidism will need iodine. Yeah, there are cases where hyperthyroid patients will need iodine, especially the iodine that I talked earlier about that is bioavailable. There are cases. Uh, and similarly, there are cases where uh, hypothyroid patients may not need iodine. Are you a supplementation. What I'm <laughs> iodine supplementation. That's why I said earlier on, tests are very necessary and also keeping up with the patient to know how has the body responded, how do you feel, are you being exhausted or are you being like hyper in terms of behavior and, 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 and that, yeah. How do you check that? What, what, how would you, how would, a, how would a hyper patient be iodine deficient if the T4, the, the hormones, level of thyroxine and the iodothyronine, the iodine is what produces the T4. Yes. So for hyperthyroid, of course, that means the T4, when you do the test, the, T4's num the T4 numbers are on a higher level. But that T4, for the production of that, it needs, it needs iodine. So I just want you to expound on a hyperthyroid patient may not need iodine, or is it the other way? May need, may need iodine, yes. and a hypothyroid patient may actually not need iodine. Because I think that's where we run to. Let me give an example. Um, there are hypothyroid patients who go through pterodectomy at the same time radioactive iodine therapy. Okay. You know the easiest way to uh, minimize the symptoms that come as a result of radioactive iodine therapy is the use of natural iodine. Okay. Okay. So that's a classic case of where a hyperthyroid patient may need iodine. Okay, but once the patient has gone through the the radioactivity, they've already, they're already hypo. It's like automatically they become hypo. That's another area. Uh, they, have, they have already gone hypo, right? Yes. Now, there is, a, uh, there is a case where these are a hyperthyroid patient who is, uh, generally it's considered they should, that they shouldn't have uh, iodine supplementation. But why is it that the uh, iodine usually why is it that iodine levels in this person are quite high in most cases there is the concept explained about the iodine being able to bind without the body uh, disintegrating it oh so it's being absorbed it's there yes. but it's not being absorbed it's not it's not used and also Get, got rid of. Like the body has a way of balancing things. If it's in excess, it will remove it. If it's not in excess, it will not remove it. Now, it's a concept ex explained especially when uh, uh, some chemicals bind without necessarily letting go of those areas of uh, the sites of binding. The sites of binding, those pockets yes. we we're talking about. Yes, it seems controversial, but one way to help the thyroid even remove, uh, I mean, get rid of areas where some of these chemicals are not able to be gotten rid of is by giving something that is more bioavailable. Iodine in, in the environment is in various states, not just a single state. So in most cases you realize that the person has been ex exposed to uh, high amounts of a 
a specific type of iodine. For example, uh, the iodide state, for example, we have like potassium iodide, io, potassium iodide, and there are other forms of iodide that can be uh, uh, that, that can find their way into the body. Now, the iodine, the uh, the iodide ions, they are available in the blood, but once they get to the thyroid, they have to be converted from the iodide into iodine. Okay. Some forms of these iodides, because of what they are attached to, mm -hmm. are not able to be converted in that process, and sometimes they bind together with those processes. So, a way of now helping the thyroid to get rid of those is by also uh, providing natural ways of detoxing. I mean, pro after detoxing, now providing the natural ways of getting iodine into the into the thyroid. Okay. Yeah. And hypo. And also hypo. With the same thing. Yeah, but that's an area where one has to be very careful, because uh, it's possible to, after consuming it, uh, in in amounts which are not required, it goes overboard. Now. Uh, Something else I'd like to talk about is what is called ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is very, very key, especially for patients with hypothyroidism. It's not very good for patients with hyperthyroidism. Uh, for hyperthyroidism, we have actually, there is a study uh, that was done on amla. There is a fruit called amla. This amla fruit has similar effects as PTU, that's propylthiouracil. Oh. And they found that the regular quantities of consumption sometimes are even better, they have better effects as compared to PTU. And guess what this amla is going to give you? You are, going to, you are not going to worry so much about uh, not being able to conceive or having issues with uh, uh, the child after cons consumption, whereas PTU or, and cabimazole have some effects. I understand that PTU has lesser side effects as compared to reproductive system, but in, 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 it also has effects. Cabimazole has more side effects when it comes to uh, uh, pregnancy and also hormonal related. That's why uh, an endocrinologist will prescribe PTU instead of cabimazole if someone is is younger yeah. and wants probably to be pregnant or is already uh, pregnant. Other things for hyperthyroidism and hyperthyroidism related conditions include like the use of uh, something called uh, bagoweed. Bagoweed. Uh, bagoweed is very very good. On the other hand, hypothyroidism. I've mentioned things like ashwagandha. Mm -hmm. uh, there is something else also called madawa. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good plant that also helps with uh, hormones a lot, besides the, the thyroid. Remember, hypothyroidism is uh, the thyroid has is being a bit a little bit lazy. Uh, there are also mechanical ways of even waking up the thyroid for a lazy thyroid. Mm. Uh, the use of uh, the use of uh, like cayenne pepper or cayenne poultice mm. from the outside of the knee, the thyroid, and then you apply the poultice. Really? Yes. What will happen? Uh, it wakes up the, that thyroid, that slow thyroid. Mm. But for someone with hyperthyroidism, okay, cayenne. What cayenne does? Cayenne pepper does a lot of work of, of, for many things. But as it relates to this topic, one thing that cayenne does is it enhances blood circulation. Mm -hmm. And in naturopathy, where there is blood, there is life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you supply good blood and a lot of blood to an organ, you are waking it up, you are feeding it. Remember, blood comes along with nutrients, yes. blood comes along with oxygen. It comes along with so many benefits if you have given this these things to the body in the right amounts and in the right way already. Uh, for people with hyperthyroidism and hyperthyroidism related conditions, you need to slow down the, the thyroid. And what will that entail? Having poultices 
with with either ice cold water or ice of course not extreme but uh, contrasts contrasts can be done like apply cold to that area you that's a mechanical way of slowing down the the thyroid of course as you do other other uh, procedures in the in the regimen because in and of itself will not help the thyroid to continually yeah, completely heal but it will offer the, those moments of relief even as you are on other 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 treatments um, have I left out of course I've left out a, a, a number but those are the ones that I felt that I need I, I need to talk about okay so let's talk about this extract idea and the full like if now you talked about dandelion maybe if there's a champion watching from Mombasa Akiyoda says that I can believe you are my ende, achukwe, you juice it and you start taking. Uh, talk to us about the difference between the extract and the full plant. Now, in the plant world, there are a number of ways how plants can be taken. One, they can be taken fresh, immediate, raw or cooked. Okay. Like uh, doing your salad, that's raw. Uh, but cooking, like cooking bogas, people cook managu, people cook, uh, sometimes people cook even cabbages, which is also a good thing for, for uh, hypothyroidism yes, yes. because of the goitrogenic yeah. uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when st still on nutrition, we don't find nutrition only in the bogas. I mean the, the what we consider normally as food. Mm. There is also nutrition in what is considered as herbs or weeds. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that's where now the concept of pharmacognosy, the study of uh, medicinal aspects of plants, comes in. Oh, it's the study of weeds. The study of weeds, actually, the study oh, of plants. Okay. The study of plants from trees to, to weeds. weeds. Okay. And most of the items that I've mentioned already are those ones, not, not trees, but they are like shrubs, and mm. some of them are weeds, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, you have taken your food, but there's also this as other aspect of food that we have not been taking. These, the so-called weeds. For people who read the Bible, uh, after, the story in the Bible is given that after sin came in, uh, God gave humanity herbs. He added herbs to their diet. Initially, when you look at uh, Genesis 1 and 2, they were not given herbs. But in Genesis 3, after the fall, they are added uh, herbs to use. In yeah. Psalms 1 of verse 14, you read that he, has, he causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the herbs for the service of man. Mm. And it's interesting that in most religions, uh, they have, in most religions, have a connection to the plant world in, on how they are going to use these plants for, for, yeah. for health. Yeah, for health. When you look at uh, Indians, there is Ayurveda. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you look at uh, Chinese, which are known to be practitioners of Eastern religion, mm -hmm. they also, actually, most of these studies have been done in countries where uh, plant medicine was at the forefront to the extent where it can be administered uh, on the same level as uh, allopathy or as pharmaceutical medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can hear, we, it's in China where we have had uh, traditional Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. studied studies coming up again and again yeah. with the benefits of plants. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm here talking about plants being uh, very key yeah. to survival and also even for humanity to thrive when it comes to health. Some of this you don't need to wait until you are a patient suffering from a certain condition in order for you to use them. So we don't wait until uh, we don't wait until we have a cold that we are going to use lemon. Mm. We don't need to wait until we are deficient in vitamin C, then we take lemon because lemon is good in vitamin C or even oranges. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, we incorporate these things in, in diet. And even for a listener or somebody who is watching who is not 
you are not a, a thyroid patient, but you have had this conversation, probably you'll go and do more research on the same. There is need to start incorporating these things in diet earlier on in life. Like selenium is a type of nuts, why not use it? Mm -hmm. uh, these seafoods like uh, the ones that we mentioned in particular, the likes of kelp, if you are able to get them or some of the people who use uh, uh, supplements, it's good to incorporate them. Mm -hmm. Remember, the thyroid affects every cell yeah. in the body. Yeah. And, but that is, for, that is advice for people who do not have a thyroid hormonal imbalance. If you do, before you go buy kelp or simos, make sure you see people like um, Daktari, which brings me to the next question. Yeah, so we've talked about, you've talked about the raw aspect and uh, so there, I, I really want to delve into the extract and then we'll delve into something that I really want uh, the patients to, to get. So talk about the, you've talked about the raw aspect of uh, taking the herbs, yeah, and then dry and then I want to know about the extract. Now, we have so far looked at using some plants and some herbs while they are raw mm -hmm. or when they are already cooked. Mm -hmm. uh, for purposes of conveniency and also uh, sellability, I mean for pe people to be able to preserve and be able to distribute uh, herbs, mm -hmm. some people dry these herbs. So you'll get mm -hmm. the herbs in dry form mm -hmm. uh, where you will need to go and either boil or uh, simmer before using, uh, which some people find a little bit uh, uh, bulky or a little bit uh, time consuming to do, mm. but for the committed ones, if it's offering that profit, it's like preparing food. Uh, other people prefer fast foods, other people prefer preparing food for themselves. Um, for preparing food for yourself mm -hmm. because fast foods also mm -hmm. uh, actually the more the number of times your food has been touched the lesser you should use it uh -huh. how many hands has gone through the food that you you have used if, it's, if it has gone through many stages before it gets to you the uh -huh. lesser you should consider that okay now on the other hand when it comes to medication you have gone and purchased a supplement which you realize that is in capsule form. How did it get there? It's either it was capsulated as a dry powder mm -hmm. or as an extract. In, in herbology, there is something called extraction. Extraction is where you want to have these uh, herbs or these plants plants mm -hmm. in a bioavailable form mm -hmm. also for conveniency but also not bulky so that requires people either to capsulate capsules or to do extraction extractions there are various forms first there is extraction through the use of alcohol majorly known as alcohol tinctures and the other form of tinctures is what is called uh, glycerin tinctures. People use glycerin to get this uh, uh, to get this plant extracts. Glycerin has a, a shorter shelf life of about two years. Alcohol extracts have a longer shelf life that goes up to five, six years. Now, another form ex of extract is where biotech companies uh, use machines to extract this. Uh, uh, plants into an extract but it, they make it in a powder form. Uh, this concept is for example uh, as in, in the learning phase it's sometimes practiced in the univers uh, in university uh, I can quote one for example from the university have this machine where they teach pharmacists on the process of lyophilization. Mm -hmm. um, for bulk uh, production it requires larger and more established companies that's where you find now biotech companies uh, exploit that and use it for uh, for commercial purposes now these extracts maintain uh, the therapeutic and the nutraceutical aspects to a very high degree mm. yet the benefit it offers for conveniency some of these even before 
being put in capsules, you can use them and they dissolve with water, like inside yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah. And you can... You just you drink. Can, yeah, yeah just, I've noticed. Just drink or just consume. Yeah. Which offers a better way of consumption as compared to taking the... Boiling or... Boiling. Yes, uh, yeah. and sieving. Especially bearing in mind that most people who are... Uh, uh, clients or patients or, or patients with this conditions are city dwellers you, you know that there, there is a lot with that mm -hmm. people also want things that will take a shorter time mm -hmm. so on how you can take things with higher quality in terms of nutritional value look at the extracts uh, that's why you'll find that there you will have uh, lesser capsules which like a single capsule in average sometimes it contains around half a gram mm -hmm. Yeah, now I have worked with both and I've come to realize that when I'm working with the extracts before they are capsulated, uh -huh. I'm able to uh, work easily with higher dosages. Okay. Those ones that are going to bring the, the effect of healing faster uh -huh. as compared to taking a longer period of time. Yeah. Because initially you could work with a client to one year down the line and sometimes someone could ask like, Hi, Kwani uh, Ifani, Kwani Ifani, yeah. how long are we going to do this again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes people, when also when you look at the prices of supplements, mm. someone may ask like, I think it's better to, for me to take, to, the to take the, I mean to take the, to continue being on medication forever because it's a bit cheaper mm -hmm. and it's just a uh, single tablet okay. or yeah. even half yeah. of it. For a long time, rather than doing the bulk work, bulk work and the expenses. Mm -hmm. Now, when um, when we are looking at extracts in powder form before capsulation, you realize that you will have the effect faster. Okay, so it cuts short. It short cuts short the, the time of yeah. uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. And if someone is going to maintain, they may maintain on a few, few things mm -hmm. to keep the body healthy. As some as some people would like to take supplements for healthy purposes mm -hmm. regularly. Now, the bioavailability of this extract is quite high, mm -hmm. and uh, that's another point that is very positive about it. Mm. Yeah. Now, when we're looking at goitrogens, these are compounds which sometimes uh, may not be very beneficial to someone who has uh, 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 thyroid conditions. A good example is having a hypothyroid, uh, and then you'll hear about either doctor telling you not to consume uh, a raw cabbage raw cabbages. or cabbage. Let me say cabbage. Mm -hmm. the, the best thing here is usually to have that... Uh, investigative mind yes where you need to ask why why mm -hmm. should i uh, stop using cabbage mm -hmm. and then uh, you'll hear the science about goitrogens mm -hmm. but goitrogens here is where i will bring another concept about things called uh, anti-nutrients goitrogens are like anti-nutrients anti-nutrients these are compounds found in uh, especially plant-based 
uh, foods which are not very beneficial for the body because they hinder uh, the absorption of nu nutrients yeah. and the bio bioavailability of these nutrients. The solution in most of these goitrogenic foods is processing. Okay. Like someone who will take cabbage salad will have higher goitrogen values in the body yeah. as compared to cooking mm -hmm. the, the cabbage. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect. And you, you realize that most of these goitrogenic foods are in the class of crucifera, crucif, crucifera, ferous vegetables. Mm -hmm. This is where you find your broccoli, a cabbage, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this uh, vegetable kingdom, the cabbage kingdom. Yeah. Now, interestingly, these are also foods which are very key for helping the body to, uh, to lower the risk of cancer development. Yes. A good example is a component called sulforaphane from uh, broccoli and cauliflower, but especially broccoli, including bro broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm. When you are doing them when they are raw, sulforaphanes are high. But are we going to, to uh, ask patients not to get these benefits just yeah. because they have a thyroid? No. Yeah. When you process them, even like uh, steaming some of this, you highly lower the goitrogenic effect, mm -hmm. yet at the same time you'll be having the benefits of these other things that you'll have from uh, the cruise feathers uh, family mm -hmm. of these vegetables. Mm -hmm. So processing is very key. Another one is like... Uh, 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 fermenting, yeah. fermentation. Another way to put gut microbiome into the body is by fermenting things like cabbage. Yes. Uh, cabbage that is fermented is called sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. uh, fermenting things like uh, uh, cucumber. Cucumber that has been fermented is called kimchi. Oh, kimchi is fermented cucumber. Yes. Uh, oh, la. We learn every day. I personally do not recommend the use of uh, kombucha, because that is found from tea. Uh, just listen on me on this. Uh, tea is also one of the major goitrogenic, it has a major goitrogenic effect in the body. Uh, not just in the state when it's not yet processed, but because of the compound caffeine. Tea has what is called TN, which is a form of caffeine and also coffee. Coffee has caffeine. These two are major uh, goitrogens in the body that I usually recommend that thyroid patients mm -hmm. uh, not to consume. Not to consume. Okay. And both for both cases yeah. and also even other for other conditions because caffeine has an effect in the nervous system mm -hmm. where it tends to stimulate the nervous system uh, uh, and the regular stimulation of the nervous system tends to lowering what is called vital force. Our body uses electricity. The reason why you can be electrocuted is because our body uses electricity. When you have a touch, when somebody touches you, the body, the mind will know that someone um, has been touched at a certain specific point because information was transmitted from that area to the brain. And how, in what form was this information transmitted? Through impulses. And impulses are mostly in electrical form. Of course, they are chemical chemicals in between the nerves mm -hmm. but it's majorly through the yeah. electrical system yeah. uh, so we we need to guard the electrical system of the body because we are our bodies are highly electrical mm -hmm. and the way the brain works to communicate to every part of the body is using electrical energy mm -hmm. mostly so if we are we can see the importance of having energy through uh, glucose or through starch, similarly we need to have uh, energy in the electrical form to communicate in the body. Yeah. Okay, so I think, uh, I think that is very clear because this idea of goitrogens is a very uh, contested topic. Uh, so, um, Dr. Ari, are there potential risks of using uh, herbs or the weeds that you say or the extract? What are the potential risks? And then uh, you can combine that with, um, besides what you do, besides diet, besides lifestyle, 
what else do you think somebody could include to sort of just have the wellness, you know, the all-rounded well-being, other than diet and lifestyle, which I know are very important? Um, are there risks? Anything that has been formulated to act like a drug is not wise in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So look at drugs like double-edged sword, mm -hmm. where they can cut in both ways. That's why uh, some things when they are going to be consumed in excesses, for example, we can't give ashwagandha to hyperthyroid patients, mm -hmm. but it can be given to hypothyroid patients. Mm -hmm. We can't give iodine or even too much iodine to hyperthyroid patients. So there are risks as well as there are risks in uh, pharmaceutical medications, the, uh, the likes of cabinozone. Uh, we are, I think we have talked earlier on about, about it. Uh, uh, however, generally, the risks in plant-based medications are a bit uh, lower as compared to the other established effects. If I'm to speak about specifically the thyroid, mm -hmm. I said earlier on, for example, AMLA. Mm -hmm. AMLA will not threaten a lady from not having pregnancy at all. AMLA will not uh, threaten to lead to hormonal imbalance in a lady. But once somebody is on, let's say for example, uh, levothyroxine, you will expect that there is going to be hormonal imbalance. Mm -hmm. So there are risks, uh, as it is in both ways, but the risks on this other side are a bit lesser. And that's why I encourage people mm -hmm. to be open. Yes, you are consuming uh, uh, a certain drug, which is very key. I wouldn't at any moment ask any patient to get rid of a medication that is helping them. And there are cases where people have had issues like a thyroidectomy where they will need some dependency to some degree on those medications. Uh, there are those who have had partial. I've seen rare cases where it has been completely removed. But also partial means that you have uh, incapacitated uh, the functionality of the thyroid were hit as a whole. Mm. So cons considering time, mm -hmm. with such a condition, someone may use that uh, uh, medication for a longer time as the body adapts to the use of the natural ones. Or the withdrawal time may be longer. The time to withdraw that me medication may be long as compared to someone who has not had that but procedure. But still hope for them. There is hope. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So what do, would you recommend somebody else to do besides that, besides the diet? And uh, what I would really recommend someone uh, to do, I will still go back to principles of naturopathy. Okay. There is a fluid that contains life. That's blood. This blood, we need to optimize its health. It is from the blood, we will have nutrition to every other organ of the body. It's from the blood will have hormones circulating in the body. It's from the blood that will have uh, chemicals also circulating in the body, both good and bad chemicals. So the first and foremost is maintain very high quality blood. Okay. There are cases where people have gone for, uh, this is a whole uh, topic that I will talk about, but let me talk it briefly, talk about it briefly. There are cases where people have gone for iron mm -hmm. supplements. Mm -hmm. But hemoglobin is not just about iron. Hemoglobin has got iron at the center. When you look at the, you know, the chemical structure of hemoglobin, mm -hmm. it has got a ring of hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. And at the center, it has got uh, uh, iron. Mm -hmm. When I'm going for the iron uh, supplement, I'm going only for that single element, okay. the iron, yeah. I'm not getting this ring that is going to help yeah. Yeah. to make the, the hemo hemoglobin, the full hemoglobin structure. That's where now plants play a role, especially chlorophyll. When you look at the chlorophyll structure, it's exactly, exactly the same as that of the, hem as that of the uh -huh. hemoglobin. But at the center, there is magnesium. So have your iron, have your chlorophyll, uh, the body will find a way of how to put iron at the center to, for you to have a whole hemoglobin. I've worked with people where their blood work at the beginning of a week 
let's say we do, they do the results on uh, Friday, they begin medication on Saturday or Sunday, or even Monday. Three days later, they go for the test, they realize that the hemoglobin has gone to from 9 to 11, or even to 12. It's like the easiest way to, to help blood, uh, to, to make good blood. So uh, you, you advise to just make sure your blood is healthy no matter what? Make sure your blood is healthy no matter what, Through, under whatever circumstances. Like you can consume what? Drinking a lot of water? Do you uh, drink uh, water, and this water needs to be... <laughs> you know someone uh, can take water, after 30 minutes they go and urinate all the water. Why? Because the water was not able to get into the body, into the cells. Okay, well, so... So that's where salts come in. Uh, salts like uh, uh, the, on the top of the list is uh, kelk salt, not consumed together with the water, but uh, put under the tongue or in the mouth, and then uh, the magnesium uh, goes into the body through the thin membrane. When you take the salt into the kidneys, the kidneys will uh, remove the excess salt. So it's better you just put it in the mouth, and then the magnesium enters in the cell. Magnesium in the cell will help the cells to get the water that you have taken through the mouth. Mm. You have seen or you have experienced even when you are taking water, but after a short time yeah. you have... You need so to that means the water. My, the water is not being... Ab so there is the absorption aspect. Yes. This is so there is the absorption aspect, there is the assimilation aspect. Yeah. There is absorption, then there is assimilation. The water has to be assimilated in the body, like it has to become part of you. What do you know? <laughs> so drink, drink water, uh, Get chlorophyll. This is from green leafy vegetables. You can do, you can do chlorophyll itself as a supplement, yeah. or you can do smoothies and the likes. And I tell you, people who consume chlorophyll within a very short time, yeah. you can consume chlorophyll today, yeah. and tomorrow, the other day, your skin is as someone who has used collagen for three weeks or four weeks. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's just on another level now. You are looking at your blood, then consume foods that are healthy. Avoid the consumption of uh, Too much. highly processed foods. And if there is one thing I'd like to say, please avoid the use of sugar. If we must use sugar, uh, if we must use sugar, let's do the natural sugar. The natural sugar in, in terms of, once I was consulting with a client and I was like, how am I going to tell this client, someone whom I esteemed like, uh, coming from uh, this locality, or with this exposure, if I'm going to tell them to use natural sugar, something like sukaringuru, they may see me as someone backward. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But in, in the middle of the conversation, they were like, by the way, not use sugar, I use karinguru, I use uh, that <laughs> jaggery. <It's laughs> so, use, if we must use sugar, use the, uh, natural. the natural sugar in the sense of the likes of uh, karinguru. I'm not advertising for people who are selling karinguru, but it's the best uh, form of sugar. But you can even still avoid it and get your, your starch in limited amounts or carbohydrates which are com in complex forms because the body requires the which converts glucose. it into sugar yes which converts, okay. converts it into glucose which is now used to produce okay. uh, ATP that's energy okay. body. yeah so drink water take chlorophyll avoid junk and don't use sugar if so if we were to talk about the single, zile ngumu, eh? the single most thing that you can first target in mm. order for you to be healthy is mm. blood Okay. Then for those who like to into look into the organs mm -hmm. and systems, mm -hmm. I think we can have a conversation uh, about that. that. Yeah. It, for the sugar, does honey fall in this category of scaringuru? Honey is a good type. Okay. Yeah, you can use honey. And this other one from sugar is called what? Uh, is this corn syrup. No, no. Uh, this one, they sell it, I think, at Healthy You. It's called what? It's brown. The one at even in your scary, and then it looks like uh, that's called blackstrap molasses. Blackstrap molasses. Now, there are two types of blackstrap molasses. Blackstrap mo molasses has got benefits, especially because in the processing of sugar, mm. they get rid of everything to get this white crystal thing 
which is oh. purely sugar. Actually, oh. when we look at health, that is a chemical. That's a biohazard. Oh. Really? The white sugar? You remember when you were young and you could get stomach ache and your mom could go get uh, sugar and salt, sugar and, salt yes. and mix and give you? Very disgusting, yes. It's disgusting, but <laughs> almost immediately you, yeah. you become well. Mm -hmm. Now, it's because of uh, dom uh, dominancy of bad bacteria at that particular moment that led to you having the uh, stomach ache. Yeah, yeah. Now, which in other words can be termed as food poisoning. Now the sugar, as well as crest soda, or many sodas, mm -hmm. the sugar, once you have it, it will wipe all the bacteria that it uh, comes along with, both the good and bad. Once it is it has, a chemical. Once it has wiped the good and bad bacteria, you are not having good bacteria. Yes. So the work the, the bacteria was going to do, do you know that gut microbiome uh, is responsible for about 70 to 80 percent of the body's immunity? Yes, that at least I know. Body's immunity, mm -hmm. 70 to 80 percent. Mm -hmm. Now imagine when I'm wiping on a daily basis this gut uh, microbiome. Yeah, with sugar. With sugar, maybe in tea or in chai uh, that I'm drinking, with that crystal sugar. Okay, we, I hope you're hearing stop taking sugar. Stop taking sugar. Any person who has, there is also a direct link. The gut microbiome, according to the American Psychological Association, mm. plays a role of producing serotonin to the degrees, degrees or levels of 95%. 95% of the body's serotonin mm. is produced by gut microbiome. So if I'm tampering with this gut microbiome, and the one of the most single element of course, there are other things like yeah. pesticides, yeah. but if I'm tampering it using sugar. Yeah. So you can look at the aspect of how issues like depression, they depression, can easily sadness. In. And with people today yeah. not having sunlight, vitamin D, yes. enough. Yeah, and that's a whole other topic. The mental yeah. issues are on, on yeah. the rise. Yeah. One area we must look at mm. is stop consuming sugar. I haven't gone into issues like uh, diabetes and, and that. Yeah. Another area. I know this one is going to hit hard, uh, but it's very necessary. The consumption of wheat. Wheat as it is today is, uh, is not wheat that the Israelites used to eat. It's not wheat in 1900s, early 1900s. Wheat in 1960s, uh, during the Green Revolution. Yeah, it was went, different, yeah. Yes, went through... Uh, Natural processing. Uh, not natural process. What they did is to do hybridization, but wheat in those times used to be very tall. To grow tall, yes. And for commercial production of wheat, when the elements of weather come in, it will make the wheat go down. I mean, you can't have harvest. So they went again to the lab and they decided we are going to work on the genes. So they removed the alleles for tallness to produce wheat that is stand yeah. that is short yeah it's going to be able to bear high yield high yield so that when to feed weather, the masses yeah the, the, when the weather elements come in it's not going to be destroyed mm -hmm. but with you see when you alter something in their natural state it has a way of adapting in order for it to continue to survive we adopted a number of things one of it is called gliadophin gliadophin is gluten together with morphine no wonder today uh, when people have emergencies in hospitals, hey. morphine that is going to be effective is not the same dosage that will have been used in 1990 or in 1980 or going yeah, backwards. Yeah. And it, ha it is very addictive. Look at the commercials, <laughs> look at the advertisements. That's true. Any of One of the things that is very addictive and they use is wheat. Wheat, cake. That's why you'll find wheat uh, is used, party. Wheat is used to, uh, uh, to cut the... Uh, fill it. Uh, it's ah, used to the cakes, the, the chicken you eat the from, the, the, the KFC. from and, and, Sorry. and the likes. <laughs> you <laughs> so Yo. avoid wheat. Uh, besides the gliadophin aspect, when you look at wheat, you see with uh, also with hypothyroidism, uh, patients tend to gain weight, and some of them tend to gain uh, the visceral fat. Yeah. 
hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism in most cases. Mm -hmm. Wheat is a major contributor. If someone is on wheat, you can't expect that they get rid of the tummy or <laughs> or, uh, or or such conditions. And some, somebody may say, well, I'm using wheat, but I'm still okay. I'm using the brown, Ilya Brown. Um, on that aspect... That's a whole different story. It, the the it's brown... It is wheat. It's still uh, wheat. Yani. <laughs> so, it is still wheat, okay. Actually, for people who are looking at the aspect of the glycemic index in wheat, brown bread <laughs> has higher glycemic index as compared to white bread. <laughs> the reason is because of, there's something called aminopectin. In wheat, you have this form of... Uh, uh, <laughs> the the, the people behind the camera on a scale of faint. <laughs> so, so uh, okay, even, uh, even when we come to men, mm -hmm. it is one of the uh, most contributors of the change of testosterone to dehydrotestosterone. Which causes what? Dehydrotestosterone is one of the major hormones implicated or uh, that is directly linked to uh, hyperplasia. That's uh, the enlargement of prostate. With as we know it today is not our friend. But then no, that is serious. That Wheat is, is not a serious. friend. <laughs> Wheat is not a friend. Um, oh. uh, uh, there are many people to, by the way talking about this mini. It's yeah. it's something that is known in this uh, science world. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a book by Dr. William Davis uh, mm -hmm. Davis mm -hmm. uh, called With Belly. People can uh, look for the book and read about it. Mm -hmm. The science of uh, wheat and everything mm. is found therein. Mm. So I believe I've talked about the most single things even for healthy people can avoid. Can adopt and can, uh, yeah. can avoid mm -hmm. and other things that they can put into the diet that will be able to help them in one or two ways. Okay. So as we wind up, I just wanted to know now because of that, you will. Uh, can we talk about the future of therapy, plant based therapy? Here in Kenya, now that uh, this information is coming out, we are knowing we have a platform like here at Health Talk Desk to be able to disseminate this information to people. Um, and I'm sure there are people that will want to come and now say, okay, Mali here, Mefika, I think I need guidance. What do, what do you think is the future of botanical therapy, Ayurveda medicine, or let's just say natural medicine in Kenya? Where are we at? One thing that uh, a patient will love is having control and not feeling helpless. Mm -hmm. When we look at uh, medicine, plant medicine offers greater liberty. Mm -hmm. When you know that you can access some food and use it to keep healthy, mm -hmm. when you know that you are not fearing that you are going to use this food uh, or this medicine, this plant medicine, and then in the long term it will cause these other conditions, food offers such kind of freedom. This is in, in no way of calling people out completely of pharmaceutical medication, medications, but with the freedom that comes along by using plant medicine, it is something that we need to recognize, both of those who are in the uh, uh, pharmaceutical medicine and also plant medicine in terms of pharmacognosy and even those who are practicing other types of healing or other healing, healing schools like uh, Ayurveda, acupuncture and the likes. Why am I speaking about this? Truth be told, in most homes today, mm -hmm. to the degree of about 80% of patients mm -hmm. interact with food or have used food for purposes of prevention or medication in some form. Mm -hmm. That's true. You can look at, for example, COVID. Almost everybody used lemon. Lemon, dimu, ilipotea. Almost everybody. <laughs> yeah, it went out of stock. <laughs> and <laughs> lemon, the price of lemon went mm. very high. Yeah. There are other things people use on a regular basis, but some of them are used as condiments, the likes of uh, adding garlic to food. Mm -hmm. Garlic has got a component called allicin. It's one of the things that can be used even for people with, uh, uh, it has been used for, uh, to, to help in uh, hypertension and also diabetes. So it's, I believe it's time that first practitioners in whatever field recognize the power of food when it comes to, uh, to health. Mm -hmm. And also 
The other reason why they need to recognize this is because they will have patients who, who are eating foods from plants. It's not on a regular basis that somebody will be using meat. And in fact, they are even... One of the reasons why you'll go to a doctor and the doctor will tell you if you have been using meat, punguza, I mean, lower the intake, mm -hmm. or decrease the intake, it's because basically there has been studies which have been done linking to this, uh, to some of these conditions. The safest, of all, the safest in terms of diet is, will be uh, plant-based uh, plant foods, mm -hmm. especially when you have to around 80% of your diet being uh, plant-based food. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it is time that practitioners recognize that. And the future for this field, I believe, mm -hmm. is that as the people are being educated, mm -hmm. I've worked with uh, clients and I've come to realize uh, most of the clients uh, through organizations like these ones mm -hmm. and also even those who have self-interest are educating themselves concerning the conditions that they have. Yes. Because they realize that there is a link with either their lifestyle mm -hmm. or with the chemicals they're exposed to. Mm -hmm. So, and bearing in mind the market that is there is uh, to about 80%. It's not only, it's only that we don't, uh, studies are not done to uh, solely uh, uh, have, I mean, uh, charts or uh, to say, or a regular update to the population to tell people this is the number of people consuming herbs and mm -hmm. uh, plants mm -hmm. for medication mm -hmm. versus this is the number. It's only that in the mainstream, what is known as medication mm. is a pharmaceutical medication. Mm. Yeah. But plant foods are not only just foods, are not only nutraceuticals, yani are not only good in nutrition, but plants can be used and mm -hmm. are being used by so many people for purposes of uh, medicine. Yeah. So the feature of this is that it is a wide field mm -hmm. and the knowledge has to be passed mm -hmm. from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. countries have been able to keep up with scientific methods on how to document and continue practicing plant-based medications, mm -hmm. for example, traditional Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. It's only uh, sad that uh, some of us, like in the African countries, where we haven't passed the knowledge down, mm -hmm. and that's why you realize that whenever people hear about herbalists, they mm. seem to freak out. To freak out, yes. But this information should be passed, documented. If we are not able to document right now, let's use other documented. If mm -hmm. the most herbs, for example, dandelion, mm -hmm. that will be used by uh, people in the coast as food, mm -hmm. will be similar dandelion that is found somewhere else in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the studies does not mean that that uh, will not proffer those benefits. Mm -hmm. it, it's only to a few plants or herbs, the likes of, uh, you know, mira. Mira can do well or can have some chemicals in high concentrations when it's planted in a certain area mm. as compared to another area where it will not have the same effect. Mm. It's only a few. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, and the goodness is that people living in the tropics, especially, for example, Kenya, mm -hmm. we have plants which have higher medicinal value mm -hmm. as compared to other. other people export rosemary. Rosemary is very good for brain function. Yeah. People who export rosemary from Kenya, the rosmanic acid from uh, rosemary the levels in this country mm -hmm. are higher as compared to someone who will do rosemary in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the benefit being along the, the equator. Tropics, yeah. uh, Prunus africana, it's a plant that is used for treatment of uh, prostate hyperplasia and mm -hmm. also even prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard the other day how the king of uh, England mm -hmm. is not going to use uh, pharmaceutical medication for his treatment of cancer but he was going uh, leaning towards the use of plant mm. medicine yeah one of the things used is what is called uh, prunus africana mm -hmm. but the levels of the healing properties of prunus africana from kenya are yeah. very high as compared to when it's going to be grown in regions which are not having uh, the sun uh, sun exposure length uh, of uh, length periods yeah. yeah so i believe we 
we as Africans, we as Kenyans, and especially people interested in having holistic health, yeah. we have a, a strong point to make, and this needs to be taken a stand higher. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so as we wind up, I want you to tell people where they can find you, if you have any social media platforms, to come and consult and get uh, started on the journey with plant medicine and therapy. Yeah, as I said earlier on, my name is Eric Ongaki. I'm a biobotanical therapist. Bio means life, botanical means plants. Therapist means someone who helps you in yeah. uh, a certain way to recover or to manage a certain condition. Now, I practice that. Uh, I have a social media presence. Mm -hmm. I'm new in social media, <laughs> but I have a social media presence. Uh, the name is Rare Springs Wellness. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that in Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll also find that in YouTube mm -hmm. as Rare Springs Wellness. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a website mm -hmm. known as Rare Springs. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, we also have an office in town where somebody can come in. Okay. In an event, uh, in today's world where people do not have time to meet, yeah. we also do online consultations okay. where we'll have a live consultation or sometimes even visiting clients in their homes okay. because sometimes that also is a telling experience. Yeah. I can get to someone's home and be able to detect this house may be having mold or the environment yes. and, and yeah. that yeah. yeah so that is actually that's those are uh, that's how naturopathy works yeah, yeah. okay and uh, my phone number I'm being reminded of a phone number you can uh, get me through zero seven and nine seven one four one nine three four repeat zero seven nine seven one four one nine three four Thank you. And, uh, hey, you. thank you so much, Eric, for taking the time. I know it's been quite uh, a session, but thank you for taking the time. We know you had so many other things to do. We really appreciate you for coming and educating, and we hope this is not the last time. We're going to be having uh, many more uh, sessions as we educate ourselves on plant health and medicine. Uh, you see why I call him Dr. Eric Berg Ongaki. I mean, the information he has is just some people are almost fainting. So we will, uh, we will uh, end the session so that we can go and attend to them. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope that you've learned something. Save the video, all right, so that you can also you can be coming back and uh, referring to it. And uh, like, the like, share. And comment if you have any questions comment down below and maybe uh, sometime soon we'll have another session with him where he'll be answering those questions I've been your host Sarah Katule thank you for joining us until the next time bye bye <laughs>